Who are the people who simply can't help themselves from scamming over and over? Let's dig right in, starting with... Number six, a Lamar Whitehead update. A Brooklyn church sued Bishop Lamar Whitehead for locking the congregation out of their house of worship. This is the latest controversy for the ostentatious Whitehead, whom we previously covered for being indicted on federal charges. Whitehead bought the Glory of God Global Ministries property at a foreclosure auction in February 2022 for $1.94 million. However, a senior pastor at Glory of God fought the tax lien that caused the foreclosure and claimed they never handed over the building to Whitehead. A judge sided with the Glory of God in a separate housing court case and allowed the ministry back into their building. According to the congregation, Whitehead took over the property without the appropriate court order. He then illegally changed the locks a few weeks before Christmas, preventing hundreds of church members from attending Sunday services. The church responded by suing Whitehead for $5 million for breach of contract. Additionally, the congregation wanted a judge to bar him from claiming ownership of the building. Whitehead filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, arguing that the declaration should mean that the housing court case was put on hold. Whitehead made headlines in 2022 when thieves robbed him in the middle of a sermon. The incident was live-streamed for the world to see, and the footage went viral. If you couldn't tell by now, Whitehead likes wearing expensive jewelry and designer suits. He also enjoys driving luxury cars, such as a Rolls Royce, so he's no stranger to controversy and attracting attention in general. Whitehead was indicted on federal fraud charges and faced allegations of scamming members of his congregation, the Leaders of Tomorrow International Ministries. He also allegedly made up bank records to secure a loan for his million-dollar New Jersey mansion. An article in The New Yorker prompted a federal case against him, and Whitehead believed that businessman Brandon Belmonte's statements in the piece were to blame for his legal issues. In response, he filed a $200 million slander lawsuit against Belmonte. It's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for Bishop Whitehead to stay out of trouble, eh? Number five, only scams. California-based Ashley Bemis pretended to have a firefighter husband battling the holy hell wildfire in order to dupe people into sending her cash. Bemis posted on Facebook that her husband, Shane Goodman, was working hard to contain the out-of-control wildfire which destroyed over 23,000 acres of land in August of 2018. She also mentioned having two other family members and many friends working on both the holy hell fire and others burning across the state, posing as a distressed wife, Bemis posted on social media that her husband was texting her about how awful the blaze was. She offered to drive to people's homes or meet them somewhere to pick up any donations they wanted to make to firefighters and first responders on the front line. Bemis asked for things like sports drinks, water, socks, and camping equipment. People that couldn't donate those items offered to give her cash instead. So she made over $11,000 from Good Samaritans who wanted to support her pretend husband. Bemis had a track record of fabricating stories and faked at least three pregnancies to deceive people into giving her money. She would wear prosthetics to create the illusion of a growing belly and fool those around her. In 2011, she was a nanny for Emily Strickland's son. Strickland discovered photos of her child dressed as a girl on Bemis' Facebook page, where Bemis claimed Strickland's son was her daughter. Quinn and Starla Bork threw her a baby shower and spent hundreds of dollars they couldn't afford to make it special. Bemis used the party as an opportunity to receive gifts that she could resell. Lori Chrisman, who helped organize the shower, received a text from Bemis that she was in the hospital, but the child was stillborn. When Lori contacted the hospital, she found out that Bemis wasn't a patient there and the hospital hadn't had a stillborn in several years. After Bemis shared more pictures of herself and her supposed husband online, a local fire captain took notice. The captain reported her to authorities who discovered that Shane Goodman never existed. Bemis pleaded guilty to multiple charges, 
including grand theft, second degree burglary, and fraud. A judge sentenced her to six months in jail. Shane Goodman never existed, but he'll always exist in our hearts. Like Bing Bong. Sorry for the unexpected punch in the feels, all of you born circa 2005. Number four, the greatest romance scammer on earth. Timothy Russell deceived women he met online into buying him luxury vehicles. One of his victims, who was also his fiance, confronted him about the situation after learning the truth. Russell fled, and she reported him to law enforcement. Russell's fiance was one of several women who thought he was Deputy U.S. Marshal Austin Gardner. She lived with him for nine months before the incident when she found credit cards he took out in her name and Russell's federal IDs in a different name to Austin Gardner. During their relationship, Russell convinced her to buy a Cadillac Escalade, a Ford Mustang Shelby GT, and a Can-Am Spy three-wheeled motorbike. He may have also purchased other vehicles in her name without her knowing. Shortly after she bought each vehicle, Russell would tell her they were stolen, although in reality, he either disposed of them or sold them. One night, he came home with a Lamborghini, and he told his fiance that his wealthy aunt and uncle had bought it for him as a wedding gift. Russell also took his future bride to Florida, where he claimed he had a training session. Instead, he went out to meet his Fort Myers girlfriend. Another of his victims, Kylie Wood, realized Russell had conned her when she discovered police warrants issued for Craigslist scams he ran three years before she met him. Russell allegedly scammed people out of thousands of dollars when he pretended to buy their used cars over Craigslist. He told Wood his name was Remington Woods, and a month into their relationship, he offered to help her buy a new truck. She sold her current vehicle for $14,000 and gave him $20,000 for the new vehicle. When Wood confronted Russell about the arrest warrants, he ran away with the money. Russell then moved on to a victim in Pennsylvania who, like the others, he met on an online dating site. Russell scammed her out of $7,000, then targeted a Texas woman who lost $9,500 to Russell's fake car sales scam. Russell fooled many of his victims into believing he was a federal officer by purchasing a commemorative badge on eBay. He also bought fake identity cards and tactical gear that appeared to have been police issued. After the confrontation with his fiance that led to him running away, she canceled their credit card, which was his own only payment method. Russell broke down on the side of the road and flashed his fake U.S. Marshal badge to persuade his tow truck driver to cover his motel room for a night. Russell also reached out to his Florida girlfriend for money, but police intercepted her before she could send him her credit card information. Authorities arrested and charged him with four counts of identity theft and one count of impersonating a police officer. Having that many angry exes all at once? He's definitely a brave man. Number three, the dental embezzle. Robin Bernazzani embezzled an estimated half million dollars from her former employer over a six-year period. Bernazzani was a longtime employee of Dental Associates of the Southwest, a dental office where she had a job that had access to the company's financial accounts. She wrote checks to herself or one of her business accounts and would either forge a dentist's signature or use a signature stamp. Then, Bernazzani entered the amount she took into QuickBooks and claimed it as an expense to a supply company or dental lab. Bernazzani would also use a dentist's credit card for personal bills or online shopping. Again, she would enter the money she took as bulk payment charges to a dental supply company in QuickBooks. Employees became suspicious of Bernazzani when the dental office realized something suspicious was happening with its finances. Bernazzani eventually confessed to her employer that she had been embezzling from the office for up to six years. She followed up the verbal confession with a written one, explaining why she did it and taking responsibility for her actions. Bernazzani submitted a second confession letter with even more detail on how she stole the money and added an estimate of how much she took. In response, Dental Associates of the Southwest hired a third-party accounting firm to complete an audit and confirm the amount stolen. It wasn't the first time Bernazzani faced criminal theft charges. In 2008, she stole $10,000 from First National Bank of Durango and received a deferred sentence, which is a conviction without jail time. She completed the terms of her probation, erasing the conviction from her record. Although her defense attorney attorney argued that Bernazzani used the money from the dental office to support her family, confessed to her actions, and promised not to commit a similar crime again, the judge wasn't as lenient this time. Bernazzani pleaded guilty to embezzling over $500,000 from her former employer and received a four-year prison sentence. Wow, that punishment sure wasn't toothless. Number two, a million-dollar smile. 
Robin Bernazzani wasn't the only dental office embezzler. Michigan-based Stephanie K. Chislinski stole almost $1 million from her former employer, Dr. Michael T. Smith, who employed her for 10 years. Her husband, Kenneth Chislinski, was her accomplice in the scheme. The FBI conducted an investigation into the couple's actions, which involved local law enforcement towards the end. Unaware that they had been found out, the couple was arrested. Kenneth had been a corrections officer since 1986 and never received disciplinary action. The sheriff, his boss at the time, arrested him at the end of his shift after talking to the FBI and the local police department. He was one month away from retiring. Stephanie stole the funds and placed them in a bank account under Kenneth's name. During the criminal investigation, investigators found photographs of him making at least two deposits. Stephanie faced several counts of embezzlement and pleaded guilty to one count of embezzling between $50,000 and $100,000 a few months before her October 2012 trial. The couple took the money to buy nicer things, including purchasing brand new cars for their daughters, but their spending quickly became out of control. While they indulged in lavish expenses off the back of a man who spent years building his practice, Dr. Smith lost almost a million dollars from a trusted employee. Stephanie's daughters both got their new cars, while Dr. Smith's got whatever they could afford. The couple pleaded guilty to six felonies related to the embezzlement. Stephanie received a mandatory three years in prison, which would typically be less, so she could get out to work on paying Dr. Smith back. However, because of the amount of money involved, the judge doesn't see that ever happening, even with early release. It's sad, but you also have to wonder what Dr. Smith was thinking the whole time he was scraping by. Like, man, being a dentist sucks. I should have been a vet. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay right here for our past release on this serial scammer couple. Number one, jobs for everyone. Conman Muhammad Maji tricked vulnerable victims out of thousands of dollars to fund his gambling habit. Maji ran several schemes to deceive people into handing over their money. One of them involved posting fake job listings. When job seekers responded to the ads, he insisted they take out phone contracts at the British cell phone store, Carphone Warehouse. Maji convinced four people to take out the contracts, claiming store employees were involved with the interview process and the contracts would be canceled afterward. His Male Khan, who has autism and other learning disabilities, lost $8,690 in the scam. Maji claimed he didn't know that Khan had learning disabilities, but it's not like that would have stopped him. The other three victims lost $5,539. In a previous scam, he advertised a room in his apartment on the home sharing website spareroom.com, offering bedrooms for around $1,300 per month. He showed potential tenants around the home and asked for an upfront deposit to secure the room. Once he had the cash, he cut off communication with the scam tenants and reposted the house on the website. One of his victims, Abdul Khalid, handed over $6,703 in deposits and rent advances to secure the room for him, his wife, and their three-month-old daughter. They were desperate for a place to live, but when Khalid tried to confirm a move-in date, Maji ghosted him. After viewing the room, Zayed Farabi gave Maji $370 to secure it. When Maji demanded a co-signer, Farabi's brothers sold thousands of pounds of jewelry to cover the rental costs. Like Khalid, Farabi couldn't get in touch with Maji to discuss moving in. He took $2,731 from another couple who discovered that Maji had locked the doors when they arrived at the property. Maji's victims filed a police report, which led to his arrest. Initially, he denied four counts of fraud, but eventually pleaded guilty. Maji received a 14-month prison sentence suspended for two years. The judge also ordered him to complete 30 thinking skills sessions and pay his victims monthly installments of $300. $10. We know a few people who need those. How big can we make these sessions? Maji returned to court after making two late payments and failing to pay a third. His excuse was that the date of his government benefit payments had changed. The judge accepted his reasons, but insisted he catch up and continue making payments. In 2015, a man named Jonathan Black opened a company called Barworks with three men named Sam Aura, James Moore, and Renwick Robert Haddow. Haddow would name Jonathan Black as the company's CEO, and together, these men would commit a $57 million Ponzi scheme through the Bar Works company. But why would Haddow name someone else as CEO rather than himself? Both were British citizens with extensive financial backgrounds and were interested in scamming people. In fact, both of them were also 50-year-old bald men who lived in New York. Jonathan Black and Renwick Robert Haddow 
were the same person. Do you see where this is going? Throughout Haddow's life, he had been trying to get plans off the ground. In 2001, he struck a deal with publishers at Cosmopolitan to create a string of venues that would combine beauty treatments, bars, and coffee shops. He claimed that they'd have at least 20 outlets within two years. In the end, they opened one in Manchester, England, and the location didn't reach their financial target. Haddow's business closed shortly afterward, despite telling investors that business was booming. Shareholders lost their money, and the company left over $2 million in debt. Haddow then was banned as a director in 2008. In 2003, Haddow owned a business that invested in a glow-in-the-dark plastics project. This also ended up with lawsuits in the UK courts. Although Haddow was banned from being a director, that didn't stop him from rebranding himself as a consultant. By 2015, Haddow had become connected to 30 different investment schemes. In 2009, he posted promotional videos showing he had created a large rice production farm in Sierra Leone. He had at least 1,000 investors, but the issue was that they were paying for more land than Haddow had actually owned. By the time Britain discovered the scheme, he had stolen over $8 million. While the investigation was taking place for the Sierra Leone scheme, Haddow was in jail for another scheme. In 2015, Renwick Robert Haddow, under the name Jonathan Black, started a company called Barworks with Sam Aura and James Moore. Barworks was a company that used old bars and restaurants and turned them into shared office spaces in New York. Here, victims could enter into a leaseback investment where they spend at least $25,000 to buy a workspace and lease it back to Barworks for 10 years. If that sounds confusing, don't worry, it's because it is. Let's put it into simpler terms. Barworks owns a restaurant. They sell a portion of the restaurant to an investor for $25,000. Then they get into a leaseback agreement where Barworks pays the investor monthly to use that part of the restaurant as office space over 10 years. The benefit to this was that Barworks promised a 14% return on each investment. That means that Barworks would pay $3,500 annually for 10 years and the investor would walk out of the agreement with a $10,000 profit. Let's compare this to a company called WeWork. WeWork is a company that owns many many buildings across the globe and rents out spaces to people or companies to use as office space. They brand themselves as trendy places where customers can go and network while they work. There's no investment involved and the customers renting the sites are going and using it. WeWork doesn't give an opportunity to be scammed. On the other hand, Barworks was selling leases for more workspaces than they actually owned. Then, when it came time to pay, they asked for extensions due to productive restructuring. The delays in payments eventually led to no payments at all. Investors started getting suspicious of Barworks, but it was too late by that point. In 2016, Barworks announced that it would transform Britain's old school telephone boxes into tiny workspaces. Each booth would have a 25-inch monitor, a wireless keyboard, a scanner, a printer, and free coffee. For only around 23 a month, you could use these pods if you worked on the go. They expected at least 10,000 members by the end of that year. This never came to light because in June of 2017, investors had started claiming that Barworks was a Ponzi scheme. Now, you might be wondering how so many people were able to be scammed. Indeed, they could have seen that the locations they were purchasing were non-existent. Barworks had been presenting itself to be highly profitable with each new site, even though locations had started closing rapidly. On top of that, one of Haddow's co-founders Founder Sam Aura made sure to reach investors who couldn't verify the location's existence. Sam Aura, or Savraj Gada Aura, was another man with an extensive background in scamming. Sam Aura was the alias that Savraj used. Before Barworks, he had worked for a UK company called Park First, an investment company having to do with airport car parking spaces. In 2017, the Financial Conduct Authority shut down Park First because it was an unauthorized collective investment scheme. When he moved to the US, he purchased a parking lot in North Carolina, convincing the owners to give him a $1.3 million loan for the property. He advertised the lot as part of his parking investment business, promising 12% yearly return. He has since shut down the parking lot due to the COVID epidemic, blaming the decrease in flyers for the decline in the need for parking. He now owes the original owner
owners $1 million for the loan they gave him. In Barworks, his primary role was to attract investors from countries outside of the US because they wouldn't be able to see the workplace stations. He also contributed to creating and sending out documents stating the false financial situation of the company as well as helping Jonathan Black conceal his true identity. Gadaora and Haddow were aware of the aliases they used while working together. Now let's talk about the third co-founder, Mr. James Moore. Although he was the only one who didn't use an alias, he was arguably the biggest liar out of the three. Before Barworks, Moore had worked with Haddow previously on a hotel investment scheme in 2009. This scheme involved hotels in Prague and Morocco where investors could buy shares and stay in a free room at the hotel throughout the year. The company later went into liquidation, losing all the money investors had spent and the Financial Conduct Authority caught them and Haddow was eventually sued. 2015, Moore had approached Haddow again, looking to partner for the Barworks scam. Here, Moore did the same things that Gadaora did, and he helped find investors from other countries, created fake financial documents, and helped Haddow hide the fact that he was Jonathan Black. In 2016, Moore went on a recorded phone interview with the SEC, claiming that Jonathan Black was a real person, despite knowing that Black was just an alias for Haddow. Moore said he had never asked to speak with Black, even though he represented to multiple agents that he was working closely with. With him. In 2017, in a videotaped interview with the IRS, Moore claimed that he hadn't done anything for money since 2010, even though he had received $1.3 million from Barworks alone. Some people have considered Moore to be the mastermind behind the entire Barworks Ponzi scheme since he was the one who contacted Haddow. It wasn't like Moore had no idea who he was working with. He had previously worked with Haddow and made the conscious decision to do it again. In 2016, at the height of the US investigation, Haddow and his wife Zoya Kiselova went on their honeymoon. She was also suspected of being a part of the scam by Chinese investors. According to the evidence, she only had one statement on her Facebook that involved the Barworks company. However, she did have a post including a picture of Jordan Belfort, the self-proclaimed Wolf of Wall Street. Her post was about an event he was speaking at in 2014. She wrote that their team did a good job inviting him to London. The post also stated that the night's theme was about the truth behind success. Together, these three men, and potentially women, scammed over 800 investors and received over $57 million. One victim, a 32-year-old named Jocelyn Houghton, invested $50,000 after her financial advisor recommended the company. He claimed that Barwork seemed functional and trustworthy after hearing from multiple sources, including his business partner, that the company was thriving. Jocelyn said she had received a few months' worth of payments before they stopped coming in. When she asked where the payments were, she would hear many excuses. Eventually, she looked up Barworks, and to her horror, she saw that it was a scam. Jocelyn would have used her earnings to finally buy a house, but now she has nothing. Many victims lose their retirement money or money they save for their children's tuition. All of them were put into a financial situation that would take many years to fix. Another victim had lost $500,000 due to the Barwick scam. Due to stress, his wife even gave birth to their daughter five weeks early. They were also hoping to buy a house with their earnings, only to be left with nothing. Once investors started getting suspicious of Barworks, they started filing many lawsuits. As we saw with the interviews that Moore participated in, the government sought evidence to prove that Barworks was illegitimate. It wasn't until Moore was convicted for a separate property investment crime in Florida that they were able to arrest Gadaara and Haddow for this crime. Once they tried to arrest Haddow, they realized he was being kept prisoner in Morocco. Haddow had been arrested for, you guessed it, another fraud case. He had started a new Bitcoin store company, an online platform where people could buy, store, and sell their digital currency. Here, he had planned to use investor money to pay his cold callers. This wasn't revealed to the investors. While cold callers claimed that Bitcoin store had a turnover of over $5.5 million, in reality, the bank account only had a little over $400. Gadaora had already been arrested. Hada was extradited from Morocco to the United States in 2018 for his court hearing. The years of karma had been building for these men, who were about to receive punishment. In June of 2019, James Moore pled guilty to the Barworks crime and was sentenced to 11 and a half years in prison. In addition, he would have three years of supervised release and have to pay over $57 million in restitution. 
forfeit one and a half million dollars and pay a fine of fifty thousand dollars. Savage Gata Aura also pled guilty to the Ponzi scheme. In July of 2020, he was sentenced to four years in prison. Upon release, he'll have three years of supervised release. Aura was ordered to pay almost $40 million in restitution and forfeit nearly $3 million. As for Renwick Robert Haddow, the face of the Barworks scheme pled guilty in March of 2019. His sentence date was set for October that year and has been rescheduled several times. In April 2022, it was rescheduled again for October. While it's nice to see two of the culprits already put behind bars, we can only hope that come October, we see Haddow receiving a sentence along with restitution requirements for all the people he's taken advantage of these years. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section what you'd rather do. Literally light 100 bucks on fire or give Bishop Lamore Whitehead 20 bucks.